just look at this and you must realize that once you there are two digital flexors long digital flexors for each finger the flexor digitorum sublimis and flexor digitorum profundus so to test the flexor digitorum sublimis in isolation you will have to knock out the action of the flexor digitorum profundus so the this finger which is transversely placed on the little ring and the index finger this finger of the examiner is preventing the flexion at the distal interpharyngeal joint so it is blocking the action of the flexor digitorum profundus so any movement of the finger of the middle finger which now occurs is going to be due to flexor digitorum sublimis action which is attached to the base of the middle phalanx please watch this watch this the flexor digitorum profundus is not able to produce any flexion of the distal interphalangeal joint because all the four slips of the flexor digitorum profundus arise from a common flexor digitorum profundus placed in the forearm and these four tendons of the flexor digitorum profundus slips they act in unison so if you are blocking the action of the other three fingers flexor digitorum profundus will not be able to act in the middle finger in this particular patient so again watch this is how you block the action of flexor digitorum profundus allowing the middle finger to flex only by virtue of flexor digitorum sublimis so if this movement is occurring at the at the flex at the proximal interphalangeal joint which is occurring in this patient at this joint then the flexor digitorum sublimis to middle finger is intact this is the inference so it is not cut and here i would like to remind you of you must revise the placement of the flexor digitorum sublimis at the wrist as it enters it is about to enter the carpal tunnel the the tendons or the slips of the middle and the ring finger are superficial if you look at my hand if you are able to look at my hand it is something like this that the the middle finger and the ring finger fds are superficially placed whereas the little finger and index finger fds or fd flexor digitorum sublimis are slightly at a deeper plane so there is a possibility that in superficial wounds it will be only the tendons to the flexor digitorum sublimis slips to the middle and ring finger may be damaged little and index finger may still be intact so please revise the anatomy of the various structures at the wrist when you go back home today and this is what we call at case oriented study but the maneuver which you should perform while testing the flexor digitorum sublimis i have already demonstrated to you for the middle finger and now i will demonstrate it for you for the index finger also so you block the action of the flexor digitorum profundus manually by not allowing the flexor digitorum profundus to flex the middle ring and little finger at the distal interphalangeal joint watch this so whatever movement is occurring is predominantly occurring at the proximal interphalangeal joint so this means that the flexor digitorum sublimis to the index finger is also intact now we we move on to the flexor digitorum profundus testing of the middle finger and uh, can anybody volunteer dr uh, biju so the of the middle finger the digitorum profundus of the middle finger can be tested by uh, 
restricting this the flex and ask him to uh, flex the distal middle pharyngeal joint. Uh, your voice is not very clear, so I will just proceed uh, with the sure. with the procedure. So here, what we are doing is we are again now blocking the action of the flexor digitorum sublimis at the proximal interphalangeal joint. So we are stabilizing this by the examiner or the candidate is stabilizing the proximal interphalangeal joint, not allowing it to bend by virtue of the flexor digitorum sublimis. So whatever movement, if movement occurs here, it is by virtue of flexor digitorum profundus. So the patient is able to flex the distal interphalangeal joint in spite of the, the proximal interphalangeal joint having been blocked. So it means that the flexor digitorum profundus to the middle finger is intact. The same thing we can try and perform for the index finger also. We are blocking the proximal interphalangeal joint and we are asking the patient to flex the index finger. So he is able to do it fairly well, meaning that the FDP or flexor digitorum profundus to the index finger is also intact. And the same thing can be repeated for the ring as well as the little finger to complete the examination of the integrity of long digital flexors of the hand in this patient. And please do not forget that the flexor pollicis longus was also listed in our list of possible tendons to have been damaged. So we need to examine that also. And it is very simple. You ask the patient to actively flex the interphalangeal joint. In the thumb, there is no proximal and distal joints, but only one interphalangeal joint. And so if he is able to flex, like this patient is able, was able to flex the uh, interphalangeal joint of the thumb, or you can see again, actively. So this means that the flexor pollicis longus is intact. Well, we move on further because we did test for the motor function of the median nerve, but we need to look at the sensory function also, especially in the light of the burn injury which the patient had sustained in the index finger and the middle finger pulp. So can Dr. Saurabh tell me the sensory supply of the palm uh, yes, sir. yes, sir. On the molar side, uh, lateral yeah. three and half fingers are supplied by the median nerve and medial one and half uh, finger is supplied by ulnar nerve. Very good. So this is the, I've drawn this mark here. So ulnar one and a half digits, ulnar one and a half digits are supplied by the ulnar nerve and the radial three and a half digits as has already been told correctly supplied by the radial nerve. So this is common knowledge and you must utilize this. Along with this, there is something called the autonomous zone. Can you tell me what is the autonomous zone? 